let me give you an analogy of uh, thermonuclear fusion uh, from like a regular day life. So imagine you need to pour a, a glass of water. So you have a, an empty glass, you want to pour water into it. So instead of just carefully, you know, pouring water from your kettle or whatever into the glass, you're actually toppling a whole huge tank of water on top of your room. So it like floods everything in your room. This is the thermonuclear approach. Greetings, this is Eugene the Philosopher, the greatest living philosopher after the unfortunate passing of Quentin Robert de Nameland, who has been the greatest living philosopher before me. Now there's a saying attributed to this guy, you know, Einstein, uh, that insanity is uh, to keep doing whatever you're doing and hope that the result will change, you know, to hope for a different result. By the way, watch uh, two of my videos about Einstein, I'll uh, link them in the description. So there is apparently a lot of people among scientists, mysteriously, who uh, don't really listen to this saying. Uh, they don't really acknowledge it at the very least. Because they've been doing the same thing for 85 years at the very least. Uh, they kept failing at it, but they still keep doing it. And this thing that I'm mentioning is uh, the so-called uh, th thermonuclear fusion, right? The hot fusion. So the experiments of creating a controlled thermonuclear fusion again began in roughly 1938 where the predecessor of NASA, NACA, um, have been, well, a reactor was made there that was supposed to do exactly that, uh, to achieve controlled hot fusion. And uh, funnily enough, the reactor itself had actually the very same uh, scheme that uh, we're still utilizing today, at least most of the hot fusion initiatives utilize, that is the tokamak, right, the toroidal chamber with magnetic coils, and uh, the plasma was heated up, or whatever it is, whatever it was, was heated up by radio waves. This is pretty much the same scheme again, see the Einstein quote uh, above. So, yeah, and uh, actually thermonuclear fusion is insane for many reasons, like uh, an attempt at doing it in controlled manner. Um, and we'll describe some of these, actually the main reason, there, there, there's really one reason, and it's the method itself. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the implications of this method, and like the more, the better let's say, method of achieving fusion would involve like the betterment of our model of atomic nuclei. So we need to actually enhance our uh, nuclear models, let's say, the models of stars because they uh, supposedly rely on nuclear fusion uh, and thermodynamic laws in general, right? So it might actually involve other things such as biology, for example, and in general, like the energy sector, the society, etc., etc. So it's a big problem. It's a big issue that involves many, many different things. All right. So uh, to boil it down, like, you know, you know, for dummies kind of version, like what are we talking about here? Well, let's start from the basics. So the formation of any structure, whether it's uh, nuclear, chemical, physical, or uh, even biological, arguably, uh, releases energy. So the formation of the structure releases energy, whereas breaking down of the structure consumes energy. So you need to add energy to the system to break it down, right? This is the general rule. You might ask, well, what about fission, where a nucleus falls apart and the energy is released? Well, maybe ask me about it in the comments. It's, it's actually like, it's explainable in the very same terms, uh, nevertheless, even though there is seemingly a contradiction. So, uh, in nuclear fusion, what we are trying to do is assemble this new structure of a heavier nucleus from lighter nuclei, right? We create this new structure, and again, as I've said, when the structure is created, the energy is released. Again, some other examples from chemical world would be like uh, combining hydrogen and oxygen to get water, the energy is released, right? We get the burning of hydrogen, or, for example, the water when it freezes and creates the crystal lattice of ice, the energy is also released, etc., etc. So, again, these are examples of the general principle that I just uh, told you about. So, yeah, we, we're trying to do this on a nuclear scale, to fuse lighter nuclei into a heavier nucleus and thus release some energy to harvest it and feed our economy with it, essentially. Uh, but uh, we're encountering a, a bit of a problem here immediately because... The nuclei are positively charged, which means they electrostatically repel each other, right, per Coulomb's law. 
And, uh, I mean, Coulomb's law describes the interaction of um, uh, point-like charges, right? Uh, so this is called the Coulomb barrier. Uh, it prevents two nuclei to, uh, to just, you know, spontaneously unite because they repel electrostatically. So it's called Coulomb barrier. So the thermonuclear way of dealing with this problem is overcoming this repulsion by heat, by thermal energy. That's why it's called thermonuclear. Uh, so heat is essentially, according to modern, you know, views on physics, heat is essentially kinetic energy of particles. Uh, rather like, you know, statistically, like average kinetic energy of particles, of random motion of particles, I should have noted. Uh, it's very important and we'll come back to this later. So in thermonuclear approach, in hot fusion approach, we're attempting to give enough heat into the system so that the random uh, motion of particles becomes so fast that, you know, each individual particle have enough of this kinetic energy the energy associated with its random motion, to overcome the Coulomb barrier, the Coulomb repulsion. And thus, it can fuse with another nucleus, and thus the fusion occurs, right? And we get the release of energy associated with the fusion itself. So, as you can see, like, the issue is um, right away visible, right? It's the character, uh, chaotic, I'm sorry, character of motion in the first place, of uh, thermal motion. So, uh, what do we get from that? Well, it's uh, firstly the small probability of collisions, because again, it's chaotic motion. They're moving, like, randomly, so it's not very likely that... Uh, uh, one nucleus would encounter another nucleus and overcome the Coulomb barrier. You need like very specific conditions for that. Well, that's the first problem. The second problem is that uh, we have a so-called Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, Maxwell, Maxwell-Boltzmann, the same Maxwell, by the way, uh, distribution of particles in terms of their velocity. So only, which means that basically only a small part of all the particles, of all the nuclei, get, get enough thermal energy to actually fuse, right? The, the absolute majority are still below the threshold of Coulomb barrier in terms of energy. So, from this follows that, firstly, we need a lot of nuclei, so the, 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 the medium should be relatively dense, and the secondly, uh, the temperature should be very high, so that this small fraction becomes bigger, because, you know, the, the, the Maxwell distribution changes. So we need very high temperatures, and we're talking about, like, tens of millions of degrees, right, Kelvin? Or Kelvins, <laughs> not degrees Kelvin, if you wish. So, um, hence, uh, it's uh, clear that this approach, i.e. Uh, thermonuclear fusion, is impractical and actually unsafe uh, for any practical purposes. Uh, forgive me for tautology. Uh, because, well, again, firstly, we somehow have to confine all of this, all this bunch of particles, right? All of these heated up particles to tens of millions of degrees. Uh, then we have the problem of uh, deterioration of the walls of the chamber where we can find them because, again, something would leak out eventually. Then we have all the kinds of parasitic radiation that is like a neutrons, gamma rays, like you name it, like pretty much everything, including antimatter. So we need some sort of like thick walls and shielding, etc., etc. Et so it's basically un uh, unfeasible for any practical purposes, again. Like, yes, you might try to build some sort of research reactor that works like this, but uh, it's never going to be industrially applicable. All right. Uh, so an analogy for this. So let me give you an analogy of uh, thermonuclear fusion uh, from like a regular day life. So imagine you need to pour a, a glass of water. So you have a, an empty glass, you want to pour water into it. So instead of just carefully, you know, pouring water from your kettle or whatever into the glass, you're actually toppling a whole huge tank of water on top of your room. So it like floods everything in your room. This is the thermonuclear approach. All right. So yes, something will randomly get into your glass. Well, again, just randomly. But is this approach sustainable? Is it effective? Well, not really. I mean, the cleaning up of everything will be a huge pain in the backside, if you know what I mean. So it's what the English people call, or Americans even, like throw everything against the wall and see if something sticks. Right? It's complete randomness. We're just uh, feeding energy into the system, hoping that the smallest tiny amount of randomness will give us the fusion effect. Uh, is there an alternative, you might ask? Well, I'm glad you've asked, even though you didn't. Well, the alternative is called cold fusion, all right? And you've probably heard about it multiple times already. 
in uh, various different places. So under the cold fusion approach, uh, we actually don't need this thermal part, right? We don't need the hotness. Well, that's why it's called hot, uh, cold fusion, right? <laughs> because we don't need the hot part. So we don't really rely on a randomness of thermal motion anymore, but rather we attempt to channel the energy right where it's needed, right to the nuclei that are fusing. Somehow, I'm not saying exactly how, because cold fusion is rather like a family of approaches and various different methods where it's like a, an umbrella ela, ela, e, e, e type of term where we have uh, various different methods and approaches within it. Let's put it this way. It's just like uh, the only thing that binds cold fusion approaches together is that they're not hot. Right? Uh, in this sense of the word, at least. like uh, They don't rely on uh, millions of Kelvin or tens of millions of Kelvin. So, yeah. So, we're actually trying, returning to that analogy, we're actually trying to pour the water into the glass right away rather than flooding our whole room with it. Uh, just like we do in a, like we do in a hot uh, fusion approach. So again, many methods have been proposed, and I also have my own thoughts on how um, potentially at least cold fusion could be done, including uh, some crazy ways that uh, some consider to be unnatural, if you know what I mean. But here I'll only give, for the purposes of this video, I'll only give one example of uh, how cold fusion can be achieved. Um, uh, a caveat, though, right away. So, cold fusion is like a slur. It's a pejorative, whatever, curse, swear word. Uh, just like pseudoscience is. Watch my video about pseudoscience, by the way, in the description. Uh, and uh, recently, like in the last couple of decades, it has been rebranded to LENR. Uh, low energy nuclear reactions, right? And then watch my video, Adam's Heal, by the way, where I talk about how names are important, right? So, even though even LENR already has like a reputation of its own, like it's looked at uh, pretty skeptically among the academia people and, well, official mainstream science, you know? However, again, this method I'm gonna mention right now, actually, is already, I would claim, on the threshold of being recognized as viable even by mainstream scientists. Uh, I've heard there's a, even a device at MIT, a working device of this sort, but anyway, um, I don't really care. I just know that it works and it's enough for me. So, uh, the method. We saturate the crystal lattice of some metal. It could be nickel or palladium or something else is used in different devices. Uh, so we saturate the crystal lattice of this metal with hydrogen. It could be hydrogen isotopes, perhaps, like deuterium specifically. Uh, so we saturate... It's like the third time I'm trying to say this <laughs> completely. So we saturate the crystal lattice of metal with hydrogen, right? So hydrogen gets implanted into the lattice uh, between the atoms of the metal itself. So uh, hydrogen is now confined within this lattice uh, and it can fuse there, right there in the lattice with another hydrogen or perhaps the metal itself, uh, like again nickel or something else. Uh, and it's called lattice confinement fusion. Who could have thought? Um, so you can actually explain this with a very easy phenomenological description. Like you might say, well, what happens to the Coulomb barrier? Well, uh, so uh, in Heisenberg's uncertainty, right, uh, one of the staples of quantum mechanics, um, it, it, it actually, okay, never mind. So Heisenberg's uncertainty. So we have the uh, product of uncertainty in position multiplied by um, uh, uncertainty in momentum, right? Mul uh, uncertainty in position times uncertainty in momentum should be more uh, or equal to a constant, right? The Planck's constant divided by 2 pi or whatever the heck. Depends on your unit system, actually. Uh, so, uh, which means that if your hydrogen nucleus is confined within the lattice, then uncertainty in its position is pretty damn small, right? It's limited by the size of the lattice cell, essentially. Which means that the uncertainty in its momentum is pretty damn high, which means that it, like statistically, it can have enough momentum to actually break through the Coulomb barrier. That's it. That's the explanation. So, yeah. 
Uh, now, for practical purposes, people usually use some like fine metallic powder uh, to increase the surface area for implantation of hydrogens, right, into the lattice. Like this could be like nano meter scaled uh, sized particles of metal it could be maybe larger like that depends really uh, on the device itself um, uh, so you have this powder or it could be just metallic electrodes and you, you heat them up you expose them to hydrogen gas you get the implantation and then the reaction uh, like you turn off the heat and but you still observe like excess heat afterwards because the reaction starts going on the fusion actually happens um, yeah so that's what happens and this is for example the setup that uh, famous ECAT E-CAT uh, by Andrea Rossi uh, was used uh, I mean it was uh, quite a sensation back in 2011 when it appeared like the news of it appeared anyways and it's still working I mean it's a, it's a pretty huge device produces something like megawatts if not tens of megawatts of power as far as I know so it's like a really industrial scale type of device and it uh, is able to work uh, for quite a while like at least months if not years uh, without uh, you know changing this metallic um, uh, substrate I guess you could call it whatever so it works long story short and this is just one method of how we can like channel the energy into the fusion here we're actually not even channeling any energy like the hydrogen fuses just because it's uh it's there it's it's like uh, i don't know in the analogy of the with a glass of water it's like uh, you're covering everything in your room except for this glass of water so everything from the tank that you toppled over your room just gets into the glass anyway right <laughs> something like that i guess um so yeah uh, it, it's the same approach ultimately that's what i'm saying you don't need like uh, tens of millions of degrees you maybe heat it up for a couple of hundred uh, but uh, that may not even be required i'm not even sure but you get the idea right it's a completely different approach to the fusion in the first place uh, an approach uh, focused on order versus chaos you know uh, so at the very beginning I mentioned stars and in gaseous models of stars obviously what we have is uh, high temperatures of stars and supposedly in the core of stars like our sun for example there are thermonuclear reactions right so the uh, protons the hydrogen nuclei have enough energy to just overcome the Coulomb barrier through random thermal motion therefore they fuse that's the, how the story goes of the sun at least uh, uh, however, in alternative mo models of the stars, such as the liquid metallic hydrogen model of the Sun uh, proposed by Pierre-Marie Robitaille, for example, we can have actually cold fusion in the Sun, where it happens essentially within the transient lattice of metallic hydrogen itself, just like I've described uh, above, right? So, uh, hydrogen in this model forms this sort of transient lattice just like water does by the way um, owing to the existence of long-range hydrogen bonds between the water molecules but here it's hydrogen itself that forms this lattice uh, lattice some something like a graphene lattice you know hexagonal layer like lattice uh, and this lattice allows the sun for example to emit a almost well, a good approximation of black body spectrum, let's put it this way, because uh, gases cannot emit black body radiation, whereas condensed matter, for example, liquids, can. So it could be liquid metallic hydrogen, where fusion, I mean, the sun can be, uh, where the fusion occurs in this cold, lattice confined scenario rather than a uh, hot thermonuclear scenario. All right. Um, yes, so to sum this video up, first point, that thermal energy is the most chaotic form of energy and is thus unfit for any attempts at a controllable fusion reaction. Uh, I mean, it's perfectly fit for making uh, thermonuclear bombs, no, like no doubt about that. Right, but for controlled reactions, it's completely unfit because again, it's chaotic. A more healthy approach would be to focus on, again, precision and order rather than chaos and disorder, like uh, the hot uh, fusion <coughs> model proposes. Uh, that's the first point. The second point is that the cold fusion devices do exist 
in some dozens actually uh, all over the world and uh, again at MIT even um, as far as I've heard at least and I don't really care so I didn't uh, examine this point uh, uh, despite the virtual absence of funding actually at least compared compared to you know the billions of dollars that um, hot fusion receives uh, yearly actually all over the world again um, and the third point is that the industrial scale uh, introduction of cold fusion technologies would most likely significantly reshape astrophysics, geology, uh, well, as I've said, everything that, I mean, concerning economics, like the energy sector, finance, obviously, uh, etc., etc. And perhaps, again, other uh, areas that dependent on thermodynamical principles in the first place, like biology, for example, wink, wink, uh, but we're not going to get into this some consider to be a natural realm yet at least i need some more time to research this uh, on my own okay and to sum up uh, the video in a short sentence uh, the chaotic hot approach is worse than the ordered cold approach yes i've said it cold approach wink wink um, so the first one is a dead end essentially uh, while the second one is a very promising and open a uh, very promising area open for new research yeah so thank you for watching the eons are closing if you wish to support me please consider joining my patreon that is patreon.com slash philosopher see the link in the description or if you have a scientific theory of your own and you'd like my help in developing it please join my alternative science coaching program also available through patreon